Chapter 61, The Destiny of Yakub, Part 1. Yakub was born in 4770 BC. He was an only child. He was introverted, preferring to spend time alone with his thoughts rather than in the company of other children. But at the same time, he was not lonely. He had a very creative imagination and was always inventing new games and toys for his playmates. Although he preferred his own company, he nonetheless had many friends. Other children wanted to be around him. He was very intelligent and entertaining and very pleasant to be with. In order to please both the requirement of being with some other children who demanded his friendship and to also have time for himself, he trained himself to sleep very little, even as a young boy. By the time he was 11 years old, he slept for only five or six hours a day, which was enough for him, whereas most other children would sleep the full eight to 10 hours a day. He spent the extra hours each night deeply involved in his own thoughts. He thought about every conceivable thing that entered his imagination. No thought or subject was taboo to his mind. He was comforted by the privacy of his own thoughts, believing that in that realm, no one could intrude. By the time he was 14 years old, he had thought about and solved many of the psychological problems that still plague most youth concerning the dynamics of friendship, child adult relations, and the place of a child in society, and so on. In other words, all the problems that lead youth into the state of rebellion against adults in society that comes with adolescence, by the time of puberty, he had discovered the power of his inner self and was already at peace with his position as an individual growing up in a highly sophisticated culture. He had no reason to indulge in those acts of rebellion that many others his age felt a need for in order to establish their power and position as members of a community. It was his very calm composure that actually led him to go much deeper than any youth before into diagnosing the state of his culture at that time, and it has had been throughout history. He had total respect for the wisdom of his teachers and parents and other adults, and yet at the same time, he felt that his inner power was soon to overshadow all that he was being taught. He patiently learned all that the customs and rituals of his tribe presented to all youth, while strongly feeling that when his time came, he was destined to change all of it. He felt his, the call, this calling of destiny to the very death of his marrow. He met his soulmate for the first time when he was nine years of age. He had been told about her when he was six years old, but had not had the opportunity to meet and play with her as was customary was, was with most soulmates who grew up with each other right from childhood. She lived in a distant time. Her name was Maitzai which means Miss Manners. She was a very serious, order, orderly young girl, always shining her friends when she thought they were misbehaving. She was the exact opposite of Yakub, who was a free spirit, concerned only with the essence of things and not as much the details. So she provided a side to him that was missing and he to her as well. All the original ideas that Yakub came up with, it was Matsai who filled in all the necessary details. Necessary details. They were ideal complements of each other. Matai was two years younger than Yakub. They reached puberty at the same time when Yakub was 14 and she was 12. They had sex for the first time that year. At the end of their rites of puberty, it was during the first sexual union that Yakub's mission of destiny congealed and became crystal clear in his mind. He and his soulmate achieved loving unity of mind at the climax of their physical union. Their minds became one and all that was missing in his ideas and inspirations was suddenly fulfilled and clarified as a result of the love that bonded them close. When the climax subsided, both of them were completely changed. They had grown so much in mind and heart in that one moment and the transformation from childhood to adult was so total that many people swore that even their physical features were different. Their stature certainly changed. They now walked as two who no longer speculated or heard, but knew. The people of the town had indeed expected that these two, as the leaders of their youth regiments, would indeed excel in their rites of passage from youth to adulthood. This was always the case with the boy and girl who became regiment leaders, the one for the boy's regiment and the other for the girls. But what happened to these two look even the teacher, took even the teachers by surprise. It is usually the case, but not always, that the regiment leaders of each year are soulmates, and after their initiation, they are expected to marry and begin their training to eventually become co-leaders in some capacity in the tribe. 
But in the case of Yakub and Metsai, when their initiation was over, the teachers called the tribal meeting and announced that the tribe should not expect for these two to become their future leaders. They announced that the gods had other plans for them. They were to engage in something so sublime and new that had never been seen before in the history of the tribe. This was quite exciting news, something that had never been heard before. There was a great anticipation built up all around the town as people had no idea what this new thing was that was to come to their tribe. They had no idea that it would affect not only their tribe, but the whole world. Yakub and Matsai were married several months after the end of their initiation festival of puberty. Their wedding festival was one of the most well attended in, the, in their region coming close to that of a prince and princess and all this due to the anticipation about their unknown mission. Shortly after their wedding, Yakub and Matsai began recruiting followers. They started teaching a new doctrine one never heard before. Essentially, they taught that the way of life of their ancestors throughout their entire history had been one that had limited the people's freedom. They shocked the people with this new teaching, claiming that the peace and prosperity their ancestors had known throughout all history was due to the fact that they were not allowed to express their total freedom to create. He claimed and proved to those who would listen that there were certain realities in our imagination as well as our bodies that were deliberately suppressed by the leaders especially the 24 elders. He said that the elders were responsible for it and were the custodians of all that was taught in the initiations. Hence, they had the power to withhold certain realities from the people, realities that if they were known, the people would clearly see that it was a form of oppression whereby they were denied the knowledge of certain aspects of the mind and body. This denial of knowledge, he said, guaranteed that there would always be peace. He asserted that the peace that came from this form of subtle oppression was not a true peace. He had the knowledge, he told them, that it revealed would upset this peace and expose its weakness. The majority of the people, when they heard of this new teaching, turned their backs on Yakub and Matsai. They replied, what do we want with a teaching that would replace peace with chaos, goodness with evil? We are not interested in such a teaching. We are perfectly satisfied with the teachings of our ancestors that the elders gave to us as a free gift out of their own love. If indeed there are things that must be prevented from manifesting in order to guarantee our peace and the peace of our descendants, then we have no qualms with their prevention. But there were a few who were curious. They asked them, what are the things that you say are hidden in our minds and bodies that if allowed to come out would disturb our peace? We are certainly curious to know and we'll follow you to find out. When the number of people who followed them had reached 60,000, Yakub and Matsai took them to the island of Palan. The first child to be born on the island was a dark brown boy. He was born to Yakub and Matsai when she was 16 years old and he was 18, about two years after their arrival. Although the child was very dark brown, his skin was still a contrast to the skin of his parents who were pitch black in color. Part two. Now, to understand the answer to your question about why Yahweh and the Elohim went to Sirius, put yourself in the place of Yahweh as he was growing up. He was called Yakub, which means big headed. He had a large brain and all of it was occupied with bringing mischief to the world. Imagine being the very first person to bring murder and mayhem, violence and hatred to the whole world. In fact, not just the world, but the whole universe. Imagine being the first, very first one to do this. Your mind has to be completely saturated with this thought and your determination be at such a high pitch where you hardly think of anything else. You are born into a world of love and peace where sin, murder and violence are completely unknown. You must bring these things into the world for the very first time. What must the people think of you? They think no less than that you are Satan, the evil scientist. That's exactly what they called him, the evil scientist who will bring death and mayhem and totally destroy our peace. And what do you think is going on in his mind when he hears all this talk about him? Since he was determined nothing could sway him from his mission, it was his destiny, he can only think, well, if your peace can be destroyed, then it's not worth much. It should be destroyed. With a mind like that, he could not concern himself too much with love and peace, especially during his early manhood when he began to recruit his followers. Perhaps in time when he matured to be an old man, he would grow wise and realize that nothing can surpass or supplant 
the peace and love of God, which is eternal. But there was no guarantee that he would reach such a level of wisdom given the nature of his mission. Now, in all honesty, Yakub was not an evil man. He was a very determined man. He had determined in his mind to test the love of God. He concluded that the reason people lived in love and peace and knew nothing else other than love and peace was because they had never been exposed to evil and ignorance. He reasoned to his followers and convinced them that if they could be exposed to sin and error, the nature of evil itself would overpower the nature of good. He told his followers that the leaders were surely afraid of evil and would do anything and everything in their power to make sure that evil never rears its ugly head on earth. He said they, they used this, their power as full gods to suppress the emergence of evil because they were afraid of its power. He claimed that if given a chance, evil could overcome good. And he concluded if that is the case, then evil, not good, is the true nature of God. And if the elders truly knew that not to be the case, then why will they not let evil come into this world so that good can prove itself? This was a very convincing and logical argument and it gained him enough followers that he was able to launch his mission. Of course, there were many, many more who opposed him than those who followed him, but he had the minimum number of 60,000 volunteers that was necessary to begin that which was his destiny. Even though Yakub berated the leaders, they remained totally neutral to his teaching. Yakub did not know he was a child of destiny, but the elders knew. They knew every detail of his mission and had even prepared the road for him over the previous 44,000 years before he was born. He knew nothing of this at the time. This was how it should be because his determination was completely genuine and honest. Remember that even though the lives of all people on earth are ruled by destiny, they are nonetheless genuine and brand new. The newborn people themselves know nothing of their destiny. As soon as the soul is conceived, he or she is separated from the knowledge of the elders who are the only ones who know the destiny of every soul. To them, the future is history. But to the souls themselves, life is pure and brand new, totally and completely genuine. Hence, when the thoughts of evil ran through Yakub's mind, to him they were original thoughts, genuine and unpretentious, and were being formulated for the first time in the mind of any man. The elders, on the other hand, are the culmination of perfection. They have reached a level of peace that Jesus described as the peace that passes understanding. There is nothing on earth that can disturb their peace. Hence, they were able to take Yakub's rebellion in stride and were not in the least ruffled by it. They know the end from the beginning. When it is said that there was a war in heaven between good and evil, this war did not involve God at all. God in the person of the 24 elders is always above the tension of opposites. God is the reconciliation of opposites. So we have heard of how this story of Yakub was depicted in ancient literature as the war between God and his rebellious angels led by the evil Satan and that God cast the rebels out of heaven. It is true that the elders cast Yakub out of their society and banished him to an island, but the reason for it is not that God was angry at him. They did it so he could go about his mission undisturbed. There was just too much opposition from the ordinary citizens of heaven, the peaceful society, that Yakub could not have succeeded had he tried to establish his ideas in their midst. The best alternative was to cast him out of heaven and banish him to the island of Palan, where he could carry on with total authority and with the full loyalty of his followers. This background information will help you to put yourself in his place and to imagine his state of mind and his determination to do the undoable, his willpower to achieve that which had not been achieved throughout all past eternity. Such a state of mind could do no other than unfold a great sense of power in the person. Here he is poised to overcome that which all people and all gods throughout eternity have maintained is the unsaliable and true and only state in which God can exist forever, i.e. the state of goodness. He is certain that he is about to overcome goodness with evil and show the whole universe that goodness, love, and peace are weak in the face of sin, evil, and turmoil. Imagine such a mind. Also, bear in mind that he had this type of mind all his life. He discovered the possibility of evil er very early in life when he learned about the tension of opposites. As the story has been told before, he was playing with magnets as a young child when he hit this revelation came to him. 
he discovered the opposite polarities of a magnet. Given his great intelligence, it did not take long for him to realize that this tension of polarities also exists in people. As he progressed in his studies and all his teachers were greatly impressed by his unusual intelligence, unusual because remember, he was one of the new people, the majority of whom had their native intelligence corrupted by self-isolation for 44 millennia before the time of Yakub. As he studied further, especially when he went into the study of genetics, he discovered that the bodies of his ancient ancestors had a genetic perfection that naturally suppressed the emergence of his tension of polarities. He discovered that their genetic structure was so perfect that the, the tension he observed in the negative and positive poles of a magnet could not manifest at all in the negative and positive of their genes. The positive pole of their procreative genes, the black germ was in total and complete dominance over the negative pole, the light and recessive germ. This negative pole had no opportunity of ever manifesting in their body. He thus came to the conclusion that it was because of the suppression of the negative by the positive that gave good its power over evil and caused peace to prevail over chaos throughout all past eternity. He reasoned that if the negative polarity could be given just as much leeway as the positive, then the recessive light germ would rule the dominant dark germ forever. All of these conclusions he reached before he was 21 years old. He was only 16 when he and his soulmate and their followers migrated to the island to begin their mission. He was a true child prodigy and a born leader with a natural charisma and incredible sense of power, as well as a natural gift of or 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 oratory and logic. That was a type of mind that existed in this God. So he decided in his mind that he was going to become the new God the one that will overthrow the God of eternity, the God of goodness. It was in this state of mind that he went to Palan to breed a new race of people that would rule us. And he would be their God, thus making him the God of the whole universe because his creatures would conquer all black people. When you have a mind such as his, completely saturated with this thought and living at a time when we no longer have the benefit of the seven great rituals of the black nation, then it's inevitable that you will continue along the path of indefinitely. Your view of reality is circumscribed, being overshadowed by your intense desire to prove your point. And the intensity of his desire was so strong that nothing on earth could turn it around. For it to be turned around, he had to go off, of, off our earth and be exposed to another point of view, one that he could not know here on earth because of the conditions of self-forgetfulness. It was for this reason that he had to live on Sirius, a perfect earth and society that has ancestors, his ancestors had known he, here ages before he was born. Only in that way could he be exposed to a vaster reality than that which had saturated his mind all his life. But this exposure to a larger worldview had to wait until he had exhausted all the possibilities of his mind. In other words, he had to live a full life on earth with complete freedom to finish his mission. God loves all black people the same because we are all the incarnation of God. There is no possibility that any black person will go astray so far that he could become irretrievable. This was the direction that Yakut was headed in and the elders knew his only salvation lay outside of our earth back at the home of our original ancestors. Here on earth, he would experience a lifetime full of the possibilities of evil and sin. And on Sirius, he would experience a lifetime of the power of love and goodness. Then and only then could he come to a fair conclusion about which system of life was superior. That is why he and the rest of the Elohim went to Sirius. Part three. This brings me to the other important part of your question. Why did they have to occupy the bodies of the gods of Sirius? Why could they not occupy the bodies of resurrection of the 144,000, then travel to Sirius? The reason has to do with the power of the mind over the body. The thoughts that Yakub and his followers had in their minds that led them to make the evil races had the power to negatively influence their bodies to such an extent that they could take this influence in the bodies of resurrection. Their ideas were so powerful at that time they had the full initial momentum of the 6,000 years that were to come. 
that they would easily have influenced their bodies of resurrection, especially in the critical period of the first 40 days when the bodies are highly susceptible. Such a detrimental effect that could be caused by the power of their thoughts on the susceptible bodies would make it difficult, if not impossible, for the individual to unite with the first self. The bodies of their twin souls on Sirius, on the other hand, cannot be affected. For one, they do not have the susceptibility of the bodies of resurrection, and secondly, they have minds that are fully mature and pure. Even the powerful thoughts of Yakub cannot displace the power of truth known by the gods of Sirius. Although in, on earth, his ideas were the most powerful. On other planets where the ancients lived a perfect and natural life, their power was really infantile and immature. Their thoughts were given great apparent power and stature because, of, because our true power had been suppressed and corrupted for 44,000 years. Yakub's concept was powerful enough to make him God on earth and God of his creatures, but it was not nearly enough to overthrow the eternal power of goodness that abounds across all of creation. It was a light shining in darkness where even a dim light appears bright. When lifted up to the brightness of the sun of eternal truth, its dimness becomes obvious. To the rest of our kin in the universe, Yakub's talent did not lie in his ability to cause evil to overcome good. It lay in his creative power. He created a new type of creature that God had been yearning to experience for all of past eternity that no soul before him had, him had been willing to bring to reality. This was a creature that would spend the rest of future eternity without the knowledge of absolute perfection. It is essential for God to experience this also because it's a part of his or her being. Thus, there came a time on the island when all these realizations finally emerged in Yakub's mind. He reached the completion of his initiation in a level of wisdom that made him realize the true nature of his mission, that it did not lie only in him being God of the universe. He already was that, as is every Black person. That is our heritage, unassailable and unchangeable. There is no one we must fight or overcome to realize this heritage. It is ours simply by virtue of our self-existence. The true talent of his mission, he realized was a creator, not as Lord of the universe. We came into this, the universe to create unique and everlasting creations, and such is Jakub's creation. With this realization, his name changed. He was no longer called Jakub the big-headed, the father of mischief. His name became Yahweh, God of the non-blacks by virtue of his creativity and God of the Israelites by virtue of his patriarchy. He is the first patriarch of Israel, their true father. 